Give me the cue. Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever time you're tuning in the program call, what's going on on allpointstv.com. I'm George Moss, the host of the program, and we are delighted, as always, to have you out there in the listenership and in the viewership. A lot of people used to come in here in the studio in the, in the past, and when I would tell them they're, they're also uh, being viewed, <clears throat> they couldn't believe we had cameras in here, but now we have cameras all over the place. <laughs> So the studio is growing, and we hope you are staying with us as we begin to build, not only in the downstairs area, but we're building a studio upstairs as well to try to expand our operation here. And we are here for the long run, I think, because, uh, what, I've been here seven years, I think it is, and uh, I'm not going anywhere, and it seems like the studio is beginning to expand, so they're not going anywhere. John, I want you to stay tuned today because I'm going to be asking you some questions. I'm going to be testing your constitutional knowledge today. <laughs> okay, so I got to admit, I'm going to tell, I'm going to bill you. It's like you got that, you got that memorized verbatim. I talk. I'm going to ask that. you a question though. That, that, that if you had government class, you have the answer to this question here. I'm going to ask you about why it's intended this way. But let me lay the foundation first. I want to talk a little bit today about. Uh, I want to start out talking about the topic of um, this Iranian negotiation that's going on. And this uh, circus is taking place, quite frankly, uh, where John Corker, who is the senator from Tennessee, and he heads the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And according to John Corker, they were able to pass a unanimous resolution. Let's all applaud the fact that they were able to pass uh, with a, 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 a bipartisan resolution, nine Democrats and ten Republicans got together, and in bipartisanship, they were able to come together and pass a resolution telling the president that they that the Congress should be involved in the treaty negotiations going over, uh, going on between Iran the Mullahs over there, and the Obama administration over here. And so they passed a resolution that uh, says that they should be included and that they're giving the president so many days to do this part of the process, so many days to do another part of the process. And within 30 to 60 days, depending on which part of the process we're operating in, they must, in fact, inform Congress what is taking place, send them all the things that are in the agreement, and they want to make sure, looking over the president's shoulder, to make sure he's doing this, this right. And they need to be included. So I wanted to read, since we don't have anybody mentioning the Constitution, I thought what I would do <laughs> is pull the cover off of uh, what John Cork is doing. Uh, because a lot of things are going on here. And if you don't really pay attention, and if you're not really uh, familiar with the requirements of the Constitution, uh, these wool pullers, and that's what they're doing, they're putting the wool over, I mean, they, they see us pulling the wool over our eyes, they're putting the wool now over our entire heads. And uh, what John Corker was, was doing, when he was interviewed, was it last week, a week before last, he was interviewed on the Bill O'Reilly show, and Bill O'Reilly asked him if this was going to be an up or down vote. And John Coker wanted to know, no, this is not going to be an up and down vote. Uh, this is just going to be where a re resolution has been passed so that the president has to uh, bring whatever he is, in fact, agreeing to um, in piecemeal form, put it before the Congress so they can oversee it, and uh, then you go forward and, and, uh, and the rest of it can be put in place as we go along. <clears throat> well, there's only one little problem here. And that problem is this document, and I want the Congress to be aware of it, uh, if they can find their copy of it, maybe they would like to read it between now and uh, the end of their tenure in, in, the, uh, in the halls of Congress. It's called, and I hope they'll sit down as I tell you what it's called here, and those in Congress can sit down and maybe get a pencil out and write this down. It's called the Constitution of the United States of America. Uh, has anyone in Congress heard about this document? 
And if you have, uh, why is it that you never talk about it? Why it's never brought up? And so in these negotiations that are going on, and we're talking about what basically is a treaty, and you can't be passing a treaty and having a treaty signed by, uh, uh, you get enter, enter into it through executive privilege and have the president over there by himself um, making a determination, and he may and may not include Congress in what is being deliberated as if he doesn't have some constitutional responsibility to involve the Congress in every aspect of the deliberations. And I'm going to read to you what, what is required here in Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2. And it's just the first part of what I'm going to read, but I want you to be careful in how you listen to this because uh, it, there's some very specific things in it. And I want you to be aware of something that's not written, but it's, it's clear based upon the language. I'll tell you what that part is when I get through reading it. In Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, don't forget that's the uh, article in the Constitution that sets up the executive branch of government. It says he, and I don't want to hear this noise that's being made now about uh, it's sexism, they didn't say she. That's modern. Uh, that you can modernize it and we can uh, you know, make note of the fact that we're not excluding women. But at that time, uh, women were not seen as, as uh, running for president of the United States. So it says he. He shall have power, and the word power is in capitalization. They, they capitalize the word power. He, he shall have power by and with the advice, advice is um, capitalized, and consent, that's capitalized also, of the Senate to make treaties. Let me read that again without having to say where the caps are then. I'll read it this way. He shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties provided Two-thirds of the senators present concur. That's the process. Now, I've got to ask John a question here because John is pretty good, but John's mostly a philosopher. I don't think he would say, I, I, wouldn't put him, I would not put him, well, maybe I would. <laughs> because what they're calling constitutional scholars, like uh, John, Jonathan Turley, I think he's at American University, uh, American Law University, I think he teaches at American Law University, somewhere in, in, I think it's in Washington. And he made the comment um, when there were all these executive privileges coming out and they were bypassing the Constitution, and Jonathan Turley said that this has to be righted, and it must be righted before Obama leaves office because if it stands and he leaves office, it sets a precedent and therefore, we are at a constitutional tipping, tipping point, and we must write this overreach of the president before the president reaches office to push him back underneath the Constitution so that the imperial presidency that has been extended under this president will not, will not stand and go into the next administration. Well, I would like to have Jonathan Turley read um, a book written by Judge Andrew Napolitano called The Constitution in Exile, and also the book by uh, Thomas Woods. It, that book is called uh, Who Killed the Constitution? And so this idea of it being at a tipping point, it's been tilted all the way over and doesn't apply, and that's why they don't even talk about it anymore. <clears throat> but you just heard me read the, the parts of the Constitution here. The president shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided now, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. So if all, if all 100 senators are present, it would take six or seven senators to ratify that which is agreed to by the President of the United States. But he should get the advice and consent along the way, which, would, which is there so as to ensure that when it comes to the completed plan, they've been involved in it and know what's going on in the deliberation, and therefore, we place it before the Senate that's already given the advice and, sent and, and their consent, and we now see if it will meet the two-thirds test that's uh, govern that process being governed by the Constitution. Now, I got a question for John, because John is a philosopher. But I got to see if he can top uh, Jonathan Turley here. 
And Gerald, I don't know if this will take a lot, but we'll see. Now notice that the process, once the president has, with the advice and the consent of the Senate, gone forward, and now we have a treaty that's in fact been uh, signed, not ratified, but it's placed before the Senate, not in front of the entire Congress, but placed in front of the Senate. Now why, John, this is the question right here. We'll see what the answer is. He got to, when John gives me the answer, it's got to be over, it'll, it'll be heard. Can't do it uh, in private. So, so turn your mic on and uh, give the viewers out there the understanding here at allpointstv.com because we are the CNN, the MSNBC, and the Fox News, and all the other alphabets out there. We are all of those persons combined right here in one package. John, the question is this. Why did the framers require the treaty that has been agreed to by the president and whomever he is in fact in negotiations with to be placed not before the entire Congress but be placed before the senators, that body alone. Why do you think they did that? Well, historically the uh, Senate was supposed to be the more powerful body. Uh, it was like the more fair representation of the states. That was a comp part of the compromise, you know, two senators from each state so that they, they'd they actually have a bigger weight, I guess, weighing in on stuff. And uh, they actually, you know, maybe actually too, this, the term senator if you want to go a little bit of a philosophical thing, okay. the term senator actually means gathering old men. Senate means gathering old old men or okay. older men. So I mean, so basically they they were assuming that they would have a little bit more intelligence to sort of through, through things to actually analyze things better, and um, that's what assumption I think philosophically was, okay. you know. But uh, that's um, and I would say it's because it is a more powerful body of the uh, you know the bicameral legislation we have. That's what I was always taught. Okay. Yeah. And John went see what John what John did. Is that John gave us the big picture? So inside of it, since it's such an expansive uh, answer, inside of it there is the answer there. But because I don't want a search warrant, we have to narrow it down some. <clears throat> okay, think about this, John. In 1913, the 17th Amendment was passed and placed in the Constitution, which set up a different way in which we elect the senators. So now put that in your answer, and I'm going to ask the same question again, with that being a part. I forgot of, about that part of it, because actually the senators actually at that point were actually elected by the, the, by the state, wasn't okay. it? Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and All that's, right. And, uh, yeah, that's what it was. So actually there were more representation of the, of the st that particular state. Okay. See, that, I, I got to see, what I, he's smart enough to be able to do this. I can do that with a lot of persons out there at these uh, universities, and they would not be able to... Um, to understand how you threw the other information in there that therefore should have narrowed the answer down and gave us a more concrete and finite you know, answer about why that process works in the Constitution, is stated in the Constitution as it is. <clears throat> you see, before the 17th Amendment was passed and placed in the Constitution, the way we elected senators in this country was the states elected the uh, senators to me state, but they were elected by the state legislatures. And then uh, in 1913, some persons not knowing that which they do, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's pretty much um, every day that Congress meets, you know, <laughs> you go into prayer. <laughs> you ask them, you know, Father, forgive them, you know not what they do, because they're meeting in Congress. And they have not read it. And if they read it, most of them couldn't understand it anyway. We're not talking about Robert, Rocket Sanders here although uh, many of them are lawyers, but they're not constitutional lawyers. And, I mean, they studied law, and, and basically what they're doing is studying how to get around it, that they're good at, experts. But the reason why you take it, once the president has agreed to it, you take it to the Senate, is because before the 17th Amendment, the framers had set up the Constitution in such a way as the senators were the representatives of the states. These formidable thinkers who set up two branches of government, one that was for the people and their voice could be heard in the House of Representatives. That means the representatives of the people of the United States. They have their representatives there. But the federal government is a creation of the states, and therefore the states have to have something to do about, do with what the federal government does, because it is a cre creation of the states. And therefore, when the federal government is in fact involved in 
such a important in, in engagement as agreeing to a treaty that in that involves the entire country that affects the states then the states should approve of it not only by a majority vote but, but because of the the importance of the act and it's all encompassing uh, importance to all the states then a, a super majority is required and that's why it requires two-thirds of the senators to um, to comply with the agreement and once they comply their verdict because the verdict of the states is not subject to a, to the president's veto there is no veto provision in this section of the Constitution so John Corker can quit it right now in terms of acting like what they're doing is constitutional. And what John Corker's committee did, quite frankly, is has, hasn't been, I've only read two people that have be, been able to detect the game plan that has happened because they did an inversion here. And the only person that I've seen that's caught them at it was Bob Unruh of the WND the World Net Daily uh, Network that posts, you know, WND on 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 the um, internet, and the constitutional scholar Bob um, um, uh, Mog Levine, Mog Levine uh, comes on here in Flint at uh, six o'clock, does a three-hour show five days a week, and he's the only other person that. Well, no, there's another person too because I read about it. Read, read what they had to write about a couple of days ago, and they wrote, uh, I forget exactly where, where it was written, but it was on the internet, and they wrote that the Constitution has been, been uh, they've rewritten the Constitution, which is what, what they actually did. <clears throat> what they did, quite frankly, was act like the process is open to the same kinds of bills that are passed by the Congress, where if Congress initiates something, now listen very carefully to this part here, <clears throat> If Congress, which is given in Article One, and I'll go and read this to you in Article One, uh, you know, Section One, let you read where it says about the lawmaking power of the uh, Congress, <clears throat> and it says uh, Congress shall have the sole power. Let me let me read this to you here. <clears throat> All legislative powers herein granted, that is, say, granted in the, in the Constitution, shall be vested in a Congress of the United States which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. But if a bill is to become law, it has to go to the president because you want to have the power to oversee what the Congress does. You want to have, before the, it is really put into law, you want the approval of the president. And so the president must, in fact, if he agrees with it, the president will have to sign uh, the agreement, the bill, before it becomes law. Now, once it becomes law, then it go before the court to find out if it's constitutional. But before it's put into the legal arena, it has to be agreed to by the president. Now, if the president vetoes it, there's a provision in Article uh, 1 for them to write the veto where it will take a two-thirds vote, <clears throat> which would be 290 votes in the House and six or seven votes in the Senate to override a uh, presidential veto because they're equal branches of government and therefore having passed a bill already by a majority vote, it would make no sense to send it back and have the president's um, verdict of not signing it suborned by a majority since it's already passed by a majority, otherwise it doesn't reach the president's desk. <clears throat> therefore, it takes a supermajority in each House, two-thirds in the House and then two-thirds in the Senate to override or to impugn the veto and to um, put in the law despite the president's objections. So it takes two thirds vote in the House to override the president's objections. And it takes a two thirds vote in the Senate. That means 290 votes in the, in the House and six, seven votes in the Senate. <clears throat> but that's not the process in the treaty arrangement. <clears throat> in other words, in the, in the, the difference is that when the bill, listen this carefully, when a bill is initiated by the Congress, then that is subject that is subject to the president's approval. 
and in the absence of which then it, his disapproval can be overridden by a two-thirds vote. But in the treaty, which is initiated by the president, see there's a difference. The treaty is initiated by the president of the United States, and you probably saw them getting upset when, uh, what was it, uh, how many, 47 I think it was, 47 members of the Congress initiated a conversation in writing, sending a letter over to the Moodles, and all this was nothing but theatrical charade as well, but they sent a letter to the Moodles saying that if the agreement is made with the president and they disagree with it, the next president coming in will uh, be able to tear the agreement up and it will have no credence if it's agreed to because the next president may well come in and um, tear it up uh, pretty much, which is more nonsense on the part of the members of the of the Congress because if it had gone through the process then in, and agreed to by the Congress the way it's mandated in the Constitution, no president can come behind it and then suborn and say, I disagree with it because it's not subject to the president, president's uh, veto. Once the states have spoken, and not both branches are able to speak on this, only the Senate, once the states then, in effect, have spoken, no longer uh, would that be the case because of the uh, fact the senators elected by the popular election right now, but the process has not been changed in terms of the senators having to approve it. So once they have spoken, it cannot be overridden by the president. See, I, I mean, I, I don't, I think, I think the critics of the, the people who are proposed the president in this are overly sensitive. They, they act like almost he should be given this carte blanche approval because he's the first black president. And any kind of question on his ability to do what he wants to do and his ability constitutionally to do what he's proposing to do <laughs> is like any kind of a position or any kind of question about that's considered racist. Yeah. But um, what the question I like to know is... It's I, unconstitutional. See, but the thing is, I, I, see, I would take it as an affront, too, if somebody was saying, if I was negotiating something... And I think again, he has to he has to get approval from Congress. So he should have gone to Congress before and pitched his ideas yes, before sure. he went and approached Iraq. That's, that's so, constant advice. But see, the thing is, if, some people told me they 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 and they don't like Obama. They don't they're not on board. They're constitutionalists. But they said the way that they did that, the way they sent that letter to the Iraqis, you know, the representative of the Iraqi people or whatever. Um, is kind of like they thought that was kind of like um a, they would take it as a slap in the face if somebody would do that to them. But again, I think because Obama's had such a history mm -hmm. of overstepping his bounds and mm -hmm. overreacting and over and you know basically disregarding the Constitution, mm -hmm. maybe they felt the need to do that. But I mean, these people cries who are the crying out there they should be put on for trial for treason. I think it's absurd. I think Obama has done more that I consider treasonous than what these forty seven mm -hmm. congressmen, these forty seven people have done. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's what I. But I, I don't know if I. I would have done it that way, but I could see why they yeah. did it because he has a, over, a history of overreaching. Yeah, I, I would not have done it that way either. And I, I'll tell you what they were doing, and, I, and they're very much in the ballpark of what about what the uh, what these members of Congress were doing, the 47 members that signatured that um, that communication. They were trying to do through the back door, which they didn't have the courage to do in the front door. <clears throat> they didn't want to be seen as coming up against uh, Obama as you were saying, for the reason that you mentioned, uh, because they're political cowards. And they did the same thing with uh, Netanyahu. They didn't have the courage to stand up uh, to what Obama was doing. And they brought Netanyahu in here to do it, to uh, have him stand there and make the case about why this negotiation should not go on with these uh, moves. They wanted him to do their work. Yeah, see, and that's another thing, is too. Uh, that's, same uh, thing. See, yeah, I was going to say, because yeah, I, I remember... I remember one time a pope spoke in front of Congress. I mean, one of the popes, I forget. I think it might have been John Paul II. So they're saying that this is unprecedented. This isn't normal. Uh, there are no foreigners speak in front of our Congress. And I'm like, yeah, I think I've seen a few of them do that. They addressed, you know, the Congress before. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to that, say that that doesn't happen at all is it's an absurd thing. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I just have a have real issue with, yeah, because see, in a way, though, they, they, the left took what these 47 guys did, and they played right into their hands. They played right into their hands. Look, they, they, they are so suspicious and so racist and suspicious of Obama. This is this is an underhanded thing what they did. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the pre, the you know majority of the people who are uneducated about the Constitution see it that way too. They know they could play on the low information people out they, there. They do that all the time. The uh, the way you respond to that is to respond to it with political will and conviction to refuse to bend and buck dance and bow down to those kinds of accusations. They're not going to go away until they're confronted. And you have to have courage in order to do that. These are accusations that the 
people are opposing this president who has been way over the pale. <clears throat> I mean, whatever the imperial presidency was under Nixon, and whatever has been over the course of um, years since, I think, since 1913, because I think that's what we begin to see, um, uh, I, this overreach that's been consistently an overreach in the presidency, although it goes back even before that. But uh, you can certainly say at, the, at 1913, you see the humongous government now beginning to increase its size because of its access to the uh, uh, another source of income that allows it to grow into the uh, monstrosity that has now become where you have 2.3 million people that's in the federal government. That couldn't have happened if they not had a revenue stream that feeds that kind of uh, monstrosity that's been put in place in Washington today. But we have an imperial presidency now that whatever it was prior to Obama taking that office, whatever it was previous to his uh, being inaugurated in 2009, it is much more of that uh, than has ever been on the end of the president. And this president, quite frankly, does not have any respect for the Constitution <clears throat> by the mere fact that none of it has ever applied and never, ever been applicable since he's been in office. And that's clear. And for them not, for the members of Congress to have a constitutional response to that type of grabbing of power and not apply it is a certain amount of cowardice on their part. And if they are too afraid to do their jobs, then they should have enough um, political uh, will to step down from the office and let someone else take their place. That's how the process should, should work. But we send people to Washington to do uh, the, uh, their job, and their job is to do that which they were sworn to do, and that was to uphold the Constitution of the United States. They, that's a, you can't even, uh, go into office without having pledged to do that. That's what they do on, on the... Um, uh, the, that's what Obama does on the 20th of January. That's what he did in, on the 20th of January, 2009. I think he may have done it twice because there is, um, I think that was uh, on a Sunday, and I think that was, I, I think the 21st was Monday, <clears throat> and they were celebrating King's birthday and, and so on. So I think that on that day he did the insulate, he did it twice, but some of it was because he messed up in terms of how. Um, uh, John Roberts had read what was his responsibilities were, and they weren't sure if it had become official by the way in which it was carried out. It was a bungling job that occurred, so they had to do it over again for that reason as well. But um, the, the, main, the, the, main, the main point is that they, they swear or they affirm. It, it allows you to do both. You can swear or you can affirm, but the bottom line is that you are affirming or swearing uphold the Constitution of the United States. You can't be installed in office without that affirmation. You can't remain silent on that and be inaugurated into uh, the Congress, which takes place on the 3rd of uh, January every two years. And um, the president installed in the executive branch of government every four years, unless something cataclysmic occurs that causes an intervention that is unseen. And that's the verdict of the Constitution. And they get in there and they act as if that is not the oath that they took. But that is the oath. And you have to take that oath. You, you can, and, it, and, and, there, and that's one thing about the Constitution. When it wants to say but or it says except or unless, unless it has those words in it, then that is without exception. And I can tell you that in that provision, when they say, for example, that the Congress, I'm gonna read this again. You won't hear a but and and or unless uh, in the uh, reading. You see, when it says that the uh, legislative powers are granted, shall be granted to the uh, Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives, it doesn't say unless uh, there, unless the president decides to do it himself. And if the president begins to um, make uh, what amounts to law and there's no and, if, and but, or unless, uh, except those words are not found in the Constitution, then any uh, making of law that's not made by the Congress of the United States, not just one branch of it, but by both branches, because it says it's made up of both the House and, and the Senate, then that becomes unconstitutional. All of it. 
And so this, this um, not confronting the president, the president has to be confronted because the fidelity is not to the president, the fidelity is to the Constitution of the United States. I wish the people in, in Washington could understand that. And if they understand it, to follow it. Because if they did just that part, I would gather to say, and bet a dime to a donut, that that would fix 90% of the problems of this country. If they would just simply have fidelity to the Constitution. And let me to say this to the people in Washington, D.C. Those who are aspiring, those in, in Congress who are aspiring to be president in 2016, and those outside of the Congress, such as um, Scott Walker in Wisconsin, and um, Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton, and anyone else who throws their head in the ring, I understand that Mike that um, Mike Huckabee is going to announce on the 5th of May, and um, I think he's running for sure. And Dr. Ben Carson, he seems like he's uh, slated to announce his campaign for the presidency, and he's going to announce it on May the 4th. I don't see him calling a press conference and saying he's not going to run. <clears throat> and, and others that may well, and, and I'm hearing, uh, um, uh, um, I think his name is O'Malley, the former governor of Maryland, and uh, there's another person I can't keep thinking of his name right now is also uh, thinking about challenging uh, Hillary Clinton uh, because of uh, some of the things she's, she seems to be wo being wounded according to the polls. So some of them may now feel advantaged in the, throwing their head in the ring from the Democratic Party side. Whoever the persons are, we don't, we, well, first of all, let me say this, we don't need any more uh, uh, persons going to the polls thinking that we need to um, uh, in some of the so-called glass ceilings uh, in this country, we need we need a we need a president that will uh, in fact follow the law, and show fidelity to the Constitution. And I don't see a lot. Of, I don't. Perhaps one out there so far. I won't say what what I think the one is until I, you know, get more information. We will be able. This is to be an unfolding um, a conversation we'll be having here at AllPointsTV.com, but. There, there are not many that's running that have shown a fidelity to the Constitution. And I can name some names right now, but I'll hold off on that part. But there, there are some people that are running from this office right now that have shown nothing but a disdain for the Constitution, and they must be eliminated from the process. We're not, we don't have any more wiggle room, quite frankly, in this country for, to err, but on the side of caution. Anyone that has shown any proclivity in the past not to be a person that is holding on to this document cannot go in that office now just because of any symbolism. And it really was a mistake in Obama's case. And you see what that's gotten of the country. <clears throat> this man is uh, basically an outlaw. And you have to tell the truth about that. When you understand what's in this document right here and you see what's going on in Congress and what's going on in the executive branch of government, and let's be honest here and be totally honest and, and what's going on on the Supreme Court of the United States of America, you can see here that this document has been overthrown in this country. The three branches of government ordered into existence by the states in Articles 1, 2, and 3. The legislative branch in Article 1, the executive branch in Article 2, and the judicial branch in Article 3. Ordered into existence, created by the states. Who created that? The federal government didn't create it. The Constitution was created by the states. And in order for the Constitution that was drawn up in the name of the states, they sent representatives to, first of all, to Annapolis, uh, Maryland in 1786, and later on sent, they didn't, have enough, they didn't have a quorum there, and they had to redo it in, um, in 1787, sent the delegates to, uh, Philadelphia, to Philadelphia, and the state sent the delegates to Philadelphia, and they looked at the articles, the Confederation, if you remember, it had 13 articles in it, and they looked at it as being so weak in terms of how it 
was structured, they really could not do a lot with the document. That's why they had to suborn the document and draw another document up in, in its place. Went beyond their, their mandate, but they had to go back to the states to get the approval of that which they had decided not to follow. Once they overthrew the mandate to which they'd been sent to Philadelphia to follow, once they had um, not, once they had pretty much thrown that the baby out with the bathwater and had not followed what they had been sent there to do, they had to go back to, to, to the states to get the approval of that which they did do. And the states came up with a ratification of it, and they did ratify the, um, the endorsement, and that's how the Constitution was, in, in fact, created. Now, the president has sworn to uphold the Constitution. Anytime he does not do that, then Article 2, Section 4, and this goes for all of the office holders. You see, they've all taken the oath of office to, when they were installed to uphold the Constitution. Therefore, Article 2, Section 4 is applicable to all of the federal office holders, not, 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 not applicable to the states. It doesn't apply to state office holders. They have to, what the, what the states have done is that they have put language in their own constitution, in their own constitutions, that is similarly worded to that which is in the federal uh, language. But the federal language in Article 1, in Article 2, Section 4, gives them this requirement. This is really a responsibility. And if they're doing their job, they can't, you know, put their finger, you know, wet their finger and, wet, and put it up in the air and decide whether or not this reaches the, 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 out there in the audience and, uh, you know, does it pass a smell test? I mean, is this something that the people will approve if we do this? Will they be mad at us because we did it? That's not an option that you have. If any, if the Constitution is being violated because they've all sworn their fidelity to the Constitution, anyone who does not do that, nobody is above the law. In fact, they had a thing on um, YouTube I was watching uh, last night in the 1803 Marbury versus Madison case. And you probably recall that uh, when John Adams left office, he had um, uh, put some um, things in place for uh, judges to take their seats, but those directors had not, been, had not been issued. And when he left office and Jefferson had become president, you know, Jefferson and Adams were some, <laughs> let's be nice here, they didn't, agree, they didn't see, as that one guy does on that one uh, network, you know, he puts his hand up there and said, they didn't see, you know, eye to eye. We'll put it that way. You know, Adams didn't even wait around for uh, Thomas Jefferson to be inaugurated. He left, he left Washington in a huff <laughs> because, man, he stormed out of Washington is what he did because they had, they had, taken, they had gone around some things and, and, and routed around Adams getting a second term because he was a bad president. And, um, and, and, and so was uh, John Quincy Adams. But uh, he, he didn't get a second term. And I, I give, but I give Adams credit for this. I, look, I don't want to get, make it negative. Uh, so I will, I, I will give Adams credit for this. Adams did something that was great in, in, the, in the sense, not, not great while he was in, in the office. He was great in terms of he could have objected at, the, at this young state the nation is in and refused to step down after one term and claim that Washington served two terms. And that what they did was a backdoor way of getting him out of office, and he could have stood there and had a constitutional crisis. But he left, and that was a good thing that he did. And everybody was saying, you know, wiping their brow off and view when he got out of there. Because this guy was a... <laughs> you will read this book on John Adams. Yeah. You know what surprises me, though? <laughs> these, guys, these guys who fought against the, the powers of be, you know, in the, yes. England, as soon as they got power... And they, they wrote that document. Jefferson did this. And as soon as they wrote that document, and after they were in power, they started trying to do away with it, breaking it down. I mean, Jefferson overstepped his bounds as president when he, he tried to get yes, the... He got the um, they, uh, then they started putting taxes on people. They fought attack, uh, to, to, you know, and then they put taxes and they, they caused a whiskey, whiskey rebellion and stuff. Yeah. I mean, so these people... I mean, that's a selling statement. These people yes. were principal people. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they got power in their hands... 
They had to look around for a revenue source. Yeah. They had to do this. They had to do that. But they felt the need to. And that's that's like a morality story right within itself, if you know the understanding of the history. That, that, well, I'm waving the document. People can't see it. But, you know, you can wave your document there. But it's the same document, only a different, you know, different issue. But uh, anyway, um, ironically, this is the ACLU's version of it. Yeah. You know, But it's the same wording. So, I mean, yeah, yeah if liberals, guess what? You know, we're not reading from some right-wing fanatic book. That's the same book you guys are, the same document you guys always use all the time for everything you want. Yeah. So, I mean... Um, <laughs> but no, I just, it, just it, the abuse already started. John, you read the book, uh, 1984. That, that's what George Orwell is talking about. You know, while the, while the uh, workers, you know, these were the uh, animals on the farm, right, an animal farm. And it's one thing to be outside of power, and you can have all these idealistic notions of what should go on, and uh, George Orwell have the animals talking about what they would not do if they got in there, where, in the gates where the... Where the um, the, 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 I guess he was saying the capitalists were, and these are the rulers, and once we become, if we were them, we would not do what they're doing. And he's making the same point that you're making, John, and that is once they got in uh, office, then much of that which they were, uh, that they had written as a way of uh, stopping the person that was standing up in the position that was once held by King George III, and want to make sure that they didn't have a King George III over here. But, you know, many of them did not see themselves becoming George III down the, down, down the line. They didn't know how it was going to work, how it was going to play out. And it's interesting that in the Marbury versus Madison case, what Marbury, and I think it was five others, had, had sued for is they wanted to have Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State, to compel him to issue these, um, uh, these, these mandates where they would be installed in the offices that they had been given under the Adams administration. And they are compelling, guess who they're compelling to do that? Who's the Secretary of State under Thomas Jefferson? It's James Madison. James Madison is the, is the person who is noted as being the father of the Constitution. You see the, frame, here's the, 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 see, the framers, and I give them all credit that's due to them, and all credit is due to them, because the framers were able to put the document in place. And after that, I pretty much dis dismissed them at that point. I mean, um, Jefferson was not um, the founding father in the sense of the Constitution. He was the person that, that was on that five-member commission that drafted the Declaration of Independence. You know, Adams was on there, too. There were five members on that commission. Adams was one of the persons on there, but... Adams uh, had enough common sense to know that he was not the writer nor the thinker that, um, that uh, was, was, the, uh, was Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson, by the way, well, Je well Jefferson was a, was a thinker philosophically, but he was not the thinker that you could put over there and over where uh, Alexander Hamilton was. Hamilton's um, uh, strength was his understanding the uh, finance, which Jefferson did not understand as, as much. You see that demonstrated because Jefferson was always in debt. I mean, he, he, I mean, <laughs> yeah. he, I'm serious because he was too much. Yeah. Of a, he liked to drink. He liked to drink wine too much, and yeah. he always brought all kinds of food and stuff like that. That you know, he had foods here that the Western, you know, the rest of the uh, Americans at that point never would have had. He was very much a basic, uh, very a uh, very much of a uh, snob, a wine snob, and a connoisseur of fine wines and food and all that. Yeah, he so a, he spent too much. Yeah, he he's an aristocrat, and uh, he lived above his means. And his estate was in trouble at the point of, 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 of Jefferson's death, which was um, July the 4th, 1826. As a matter of fact, he and Adams died on the same day, July the 4th, 1826. And uh, he was indebted when he died because he did not handle the estate uh, that well. And um, the, the estate of Monticello was um, in serious trouble based upon the, uh, the, the, the lack of financial uh, dealings and the mishandling of the estate by the uh, third president of the United States. He was not a, he was not a financial uh, wizard. I think Alexander Hamilton takes a bow to that almost single-handedly in, uh, in the Obama, in, in the um, Washington administration. Uh, no one else could have, I don't think anyone else could have done that job. And uh, Hamilton, who really had, had a problem with George Washington uh, during the Revolutionary War where uh, Washington had some uh, uh, forbearance with some things that, that Hamilton had done, Hampton uh, took offense to an accusation that he had not followed the orders and then stepped down from his commission. And um, Washington, knowing that the, 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 
the utility the utility of his um, of, of his uh, service uh, tried to get him to come back, but Hamilton did not do that. But it's interesting that later on, that Washington would not allow any friction between them to becloud the fact that Hamilton was supremely qualified to set the 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 financial uh, arrangements up in this country, which was at a, a, a state that where there was nothing in place that you could uh, pull from, and he'd do it out of whole cloth. And that's only one person on the scene at that at that time of all the brilliant men that were on the scene, there was only one person that could single-handedly have done what was done under uh, Alexander Hamilton. That's what is really clear in the book written by Ron Chernow in his book on Hamilton, which I think is a Cadillac of all the books written Ham on, on uh, the, the first secretary of, of the Treasury. You see, Hamilton was a mixed bag, though. I mean, personally, he had some issues, uh, some, uh, some qualifications, some qualifications, some attributes that I think were very admirable. But, I mean, he also was, a, if it's, forget, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been like 20-some years since I read a book on him, but wasn't he an advocate of a strong, but he wanted the central bank, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, see, and so I know Jefferson opposed him on that, I believe, right? Oh, yes, and, he and Jefferson fell out on that. And so I know Jackson, and later on, was it Andrew, Andrew Jackson, Jackson actually had a problem, which is the irony that he's actually on a $20 bill from a Federal Reserve System, which he would have probably severely denounced. <laughs> you know, that's the irony of it all. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, he had some issues. I mean, this book was really good, though, because he had some he had some. Great Great personal strengths and some serious foibles, Alexander Hamilton. But he was—he yeah, he really did, uh, John. He—he he was, um, uh, yeah. There was that friction between him and uh, Thomas Jefferson because uh, Hamilton was a big government person, and he recognized the restraints were placed upon the um, federal government because of the restraints placed upon the purse. And there are a lot of things he did that uh, were un untoward. And to some extent, he was uh, autocratic in a lot of things that he did. For example, how he would trade off. Uh, he wanted uh, some things to strengthen the federal government and get uh, the states to buy into it by, uh, uh, by trading off where the capital would be on a temporary basis and trading that off so that he get other states to buy into uh, uh, what was uh, called imp imp impressment of the nation's debt. Uh, because the South wasn't going along with the fact that they ought to go ahead and, and buy into the debtors all of our debt when they had paid their part of the debt off and other parts of the country had paid their part of the debt off with $25 million of debt that they had incurred based on, upon the Revolutionary War. And they were not too much about paying a second time. The other states needed to pay their part. They had done their share. And uh, what, what, what Hamilton wanted to do was uh, glue the nation together that if they're all uh, taking part in this debt, ownership of this debt, it glues the nation more together, and it creates a much more uh, a large apparatus for the federal government to to pull from. And he was for taxes too, because I remember reading this. Yes, that he was. He was for taxes because he also wanted he didn't want like a deadbeat system created. He didn't want people actually benefiting off of other people's labor. So that's where he wanted everybody to pay a, a share, so they could have skin in the game and not depend on try to look around and say who can support them. That's what his uh, justification. I wish he had been much a much um, um, had more a little bit more integrity in a lot of ways. Uh, one of which would be that the nation has a, should pay off its debts as it goes along. Uh, that would be the last time we've had that happen was under Andrew Jackson, and, and Jackson's uh, struggle with uh, with, with uh, Biddle, uh, who uh, who was trying who really uh, tried to pull uh, Andrew Jackson's string. But Andrew Jackson did something that these politicians need to learn from, and that is he stood up to the bullies, and um, he could have uh, gone the way of the. Uh, the the way others had gone in terms of bowing down to the banking network that was being put in, in place. And what Jefferson did was stand up to it and uh, repudiate it, and then eventually won the battle against um, the, ba the big banking uh, network that, was, that they were beginning to employ. Because government always le needs money. The way, the way see, the, what the government does right now, and this is another thing I, I condemn Washington for today, is that uh, I, I condemn Washington for its... Uh, Deficit spending, <clears throat> because, and I and I, I said to my article before coming to the studio, the reason why the deficit is is what it is right now, eighteen trillion dollars plus and counting, is because for the government to be involved in all avenues of the society they should not be involved in is very is very costly. Well, the other thing is, I mean, I don't know about you, but see, I think this. I mean, let's face it. There's how, well, how many nations in the world? And we got military presence. We got military in 160 or 138 nations of 168 that exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, right there. I mean, yeah. every every person in there's got to be fed, clothed, given weapons, got to get more training. That person is a you know, those people. The military is extremely costly to us. It is extremely costly, John. And when you look at all the other costs, 
uh, that that's a very prohibitive cost there, and uh, there's and then it's, it's a lot of other things that's added to that burden. For example, look at the number of persons that work here from outside the country to get a retirement here, and they go back to their countries and they have this country sending them a check in retirement for the rest of their lives abroad. So yeah. that's in your medical field, your university field, and a lot of the other. That, that, that money's gone. That money's gone out of circulation here. In a one-way exit out of the country. I think we should pull our military back out of those countries that it's in, like Korea and even, uh, actually in the, all throughout Europe especially. Pull, the, pull our military out there. Put them on our southern border. So, yeah, we'd still have a military expenditure, but at least that money's being circulated. Their paychecks, at least. Their payroll's being circulated into our own country. We, John, uh, you are making an excellent point, and it's a point that um, if people could understand this, we could understand what's hap what happened in Europe. You see, what, what, the reason why Europe was able to go socialist, but they're paying for it now, was because we were picking up the military tab. For them. Japan's the same way. That's the reason why they same can have all the stuff Japan. We were become the cops for everybody. And then there are all these people. And they, can go and they can have a socialist society as a result of it. See, I'm not an advocate of social welfare programs. But I am also not an advocate of sending people, American children, over to fight in battles that re really have, it does, has no impact on us whatsoever, really. No real issue that we have. We don't really have an issue with us. We're just sending troops, or we're using our troops as a mercenary force. But here's the thing. We're not getting paid for our mercenary forces. If we're we're paying for that. That's right. If, 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 if other countries would, would have us as a military presence, then why are the taxpayers paying for the defense of another country, why does that fall on the backs of the taxpayers of this country? Why did Kuwait, did Kuwait ever pay us back for our, you know, fighting Iraq? You know, putting Saddam Hussein in his place? No, I don't think they have. They, I mean, they, I, maybe they, I'm wrong they, on that. They did but, not. They, no, they did not. And they and they, and they were actually saying, uh, bragging about the fact in 1990, uh, 91 that they were uh, uh, hiring us as mercenaries. And then another thing is too, I mean, the only country I know that, okay, as soon as World War II was over, we forgave the debt of Russia and England. What? I mean, could you realize if they paid us back at least a portion of what they owed us for the Lend-Lease program? Yeah. Because lease usually implies you're getting money for something. We sent everything gratis to these countries. And they never paid us back. And now they're sitting there. And then Russia, I couldn't believe Putin a few years ago, made a joke, made, made comments about how we're insolvent and how we should take more financial responsibility after his country was begging for money from us for years after those, you know, the, just a few years after the uh, Soviet, the wall fell. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're, and we keep on giving it to them. We keep giving it to them. And look at the ones in New York. At the uh, United Nations, we should disband. <clears throat> not only should we not fund uh, that organization, I think we're paying what is uh, two thirds of the of the of the um, uh, resources for the UN. They don't listen to us. They uh, listen to these third world uh, di dictatorial uh, uh, governments, and we're paying for that. And they're and they're inside of the United States rather than being on an island somewhere. If you're going to be that independent of our policies, then be on an island somewhere. Be get off our get off our land. And we're paying for the building, paying for the um, for the expense of running the building. All that's on taxpayers are, are dying. And that says something very critical and something um, very uh, something about the corruption of the politicians in Washington. Because why would that fall upon the American taxpayers? And if the UN cannot stop the killing that's going on of Christians, and we are a Christian country that's financing the UN. If they can't stop the killing of Christians, then what is the utility of this organization? They certainly, uh, the head of the UN was certainly willing to intervene quickly when we had that situation in North Carolina. And you thought that those three Muslims that were killed were killed because were killed because they were Muslims, which that was not true, but that's what they thinking was before the evidence was in. And the UN got involved in that and was uh, making all kinds of statements about what they wanted to happen as a result of that. But they have nothing, there's nothing being done to deal with the Christians who are being killed wholesale around the world. And somebody needs to read Marsh's book called Blood in Our Hands. <clears throat> well, this has been going on long before ISIS stood up. The Christians are under attack all over the world. And nothing is being, being done about it. And this administration is not doing anything about it. And we're not talking about... Um, uh, and it's, it's interesting to me that we're not talking about this in the uh, in the Congress. We're talking about uh, dealing with those uh, with Iran that's threatening uh, one of our really our only strong ally is in um, 
is, is Israel in the Middle East, and they've said that they would not take off the table, that they're going to uh, wipe Israel off the map. And they're negotiating with these people. And they can't deal with ISIS, but they dealt with um, Gaddafi, and the allies uh, dealt with um, uh, we, they dealt with the overthrow of um, Hassan Mubarak in Egypt, but ISIS can't be dealt with, and they're not even a state, not even the head of a government, and they're allowed to run wholesale over there in the in the in the uh, in the Middle East, and they are and now there's a report that came up that they're on the shores of the United States, and on the WND report it stated that that is being suppressed, that they are that close a threat to the United States in terms of being, in terms of being just outside the boundaries of, of this country. And why would that be suppressed? Why would that not be a need to know? And we need to look at what's going on uh, in that respect. And look at what's going on in terms of the uh, situation with, uh, with Iran and why the Congress is acting like they don't have a role to play and they got to be invited into playing a role by the President of the United States when the Constitution is very clear. I mean, why, why, are we play, why, why are we playing all these games uh, in this country? And what kind of government do we have in place where this kind of railroading is taking place? It's kind of pulling the wool over the American people's eyes. Uh, why, why, why are they doing that? And what are they saying to us in Washington, D.C. in terms of uh, playing those kinds of games? All they have to do is take the oath of office that they swore to uphold the Constitution and follow that. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you that I would say I go on a limb here, and and because I've not done a, a percentage of, of uh, any kind of percentage analysis of how much a problem would be fixed, but I would be willing to wager ninety percent of the problem would be fixed if they would just simply follow the Constitution. And I was saying a, f a few minutes ago that the reason we have an 18 trillion plus debt right now is because with all of the things that the government is involved in, at least three quarters of it is unconstitutional because what is constitutional is, is uh, mandated in Article 1, Section 8, uh, Article 1, Section 8, let me make sure I'm right about this, Article 1, yeah, Article 1, Section 8 has 18 clauses in it. Um, it what, what, that, what that means is that what the Constitution allows the federal government to do is itemize. I mean, it's actually listed in what is called the enumeration of powers. And if it's not enumerated, it means it's not delegated. Enumerated means it's delegated. So you delegate what you are allowed to do on the federal level. Why? Because the states were very jealous of their power. And they wanted the federal government to know what it was that they were extending to them out of his own sovereignty base, what they wanted the, the, the federal government to be able to do in his own name, but being given that by the mandate of the state. And they said, here are the things we're assigning to you. They assigned the sovereignty claims to the federal government. They wanted the federal government to know what the limits were. That's why there's an, enum that's why there's an enumeration. Enumeration just means that it's itemized, but it's, it's, it's delegated. Enumeration of powers are delegated, delegated powers. And they want to act like there's some, some implication behind the delegation. But if there's some implication behind the delegation, that has to be more writing behind the writing then. So you have to go to other writing to find out what these writings mean, to clarify. And that, go, that means the Federalist Papers. But you cannot say that you think what they were thinking about was something that's not in the language. You have to go and see what the, what in the larger landscape, the 85 Federalist Papers, what they were said are there. So a lot of it's going on in Washington. Pay attention to it because what they're doing is really um, running um, around the Constitution. And the next person that will hold that office, when we elect the next president in 2016, we must get someone who is talking about upholding the Constitution of the United States. We already can eliminate uh, Hillary Clinton. She talked about she wants to get in there and be the, the champion of the middle class. That means that she's going to get in there and play the, the class card because she want to be a, the champion of this group <laughs> and not the champion of the, of the country. You see, if you're a champion of the country, you're the, Constitution, you're the champion of the Constitution that benefits everybody in the country. Okay, we have to get out of here, but that's hopefully um, useful.
read my article on Facebook that kind of goes into a lot of this, and we'll be on the same page next week, hopefully, when you come back for another edition of uh, What's Going On on AllPointsTV.com. See you back here next week at 2 o'clock.